So uh, thank you again to the organizers. Uh, this is, uh, now I get to talk a little bit about the research that we actually do, as opposed to just motivating uh, some of the types of questions we might ask. And maybe I'll give some answers, I hope, uh, to some things. So this is uh, some work that we've done over the last uh, three or four years now with a number of uh, different students. Um, and just to sort of remind you of some of the motivating things that I talked about yesterday, um, you know, we're interested in thinking about how motion control systems, if you want feedback control systems at the biomolecular level work. So this is bacterial chemotaxis, uh, and this is this nice neutrophil uh, movie that I showed you. Right? And you know, to a control engineer, these are systems that clearly are doing sensing actuation, computation in a feedback loop, and hence control. Um, and uh, these are ones that are occurring in nature. And you know, in some sense, we're both interested in understanding uh, how these work. Uh, but increasingly interested in asking the question, could we design a similar system? And so here's now a system that doesn't exist in nature. This is a system I want to build. Um, this is uh, something that's about, you know, two microns long, about a micron across. Uh, it's got all these little, you know, sort of uh, cilia and other things on it that maybe are used for locomotion. It has flagella on it, you know, with some motors that control it and other things. And what I hope to convince you by the end of today, or the end of this lecture, is that, you know, maybe it's not ridiculous to think about building something at this size scale. Uh, and implementing a control system inside of it, right, in some way or another. Uh, and nature can do it, and, you know, can we do it uh, in some way. Okay, so uh, what I want to talk about are a number of things that kind of fit into uh, what does it take to go and design these sorts of systems. How do we understand biomolecular feedback systems? How do we design biomolecular feedback systems? And so I'll mainly uh, talk about uh, two things. Uh, one is analysis of feedback circuits. That is, given a circuit that exists, whether it's in nature or engineered by somebody, what are some of the tools that we might apply uh, in system identification and understanding the role of feedback? Uh, and so I'll tell you uh, two uh, results there. Uh, one is with Mary Dunlop, uh, who's now at the University of Vermont, and the other uh, was, is with Ophelia Venturelli, uh, who is uh, finishing up her PhD at Caltech. And then I want to shift into talking about design of feedback circuits. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to talk about some of the work that we do in the Molecular Programming Project, which I both mentioned and Chicky mentioned yesterday. Uh, and I want to tell you about an aspect of the Molecular Programming Project uh, that's very interesting called genelets. Not genes, but genelets. And so I'll tell you about genelets and uh, how we might program with genelets uh, and some of the things that we can do with it. Uh, and that's primarily the work of uh, Elisa Franco and Jongmin Kim uh, here, and then some theoretical work uh, by Javad Levi and Samaya Sajudi. So uh, this is all work that's been sponsored uh, by the Molecular Programming Project, which is a National Science Foundation project that we have at Caltech, as well as the Institute for Collaborative Biotechnology, which is sponsored by the Army uh, Office of Scientific Research. So let me just remind you uh, that uh, we're interested in control theory for biological systems. This is a slide that I showed yesterday, and so I won't go through it all again. But to say that you know these are the sorts of circuits that I'm going to talk about today at sort of this level of complexity. But eventually, we want to build up to a theory that can handle circuits at a much higher level of complexity. Right? So the question is, how do we do that? Um, and how do we both understand circuits of that complexity? If I've built one and it's not working quite right, how do I debug it? You know, what do I uh, sort of do if I'm not quite sure? Uh, whether my circuit's working right, uh, can I identify uh, the actual dynamics versus the design dynamics. So I want to start by telling you a little bit about just the problem of system identification. So how do we build uh, models for these things? And we uh, were talking about uh, doing system identification with Mary Dunlop when she started her PhD, um, and we started talking to Michael Lutowitz about this. And you know, in, in control theory, when we want to do system identification, we use forced response. That is, I have a system I'd like to identify it, or I, I you know, sort of push the inputs at different frequencies or with different inputs, and I watch what the output does. And then from watching this input-output behavior, I can build a model of what goes on. And so we'd like to do something similar for biological systems, right? We'd like to somehow push some inputs, whether these are the receptors or the nutrient levels or whatever. But it's much harder to control uh, some of these things in the way that the control theory tools are designed to handle. So for example, I can't sinusoidally vary the nutrient concentration right, inside of a dish. I mean, that's a little bit difficult to do. I'd have to flow stuff in and out and you know, somehow subtract out the nutrient. I mean, it's, it's difficult to figure out how to do it. And so when we were talking about this with Michael, he said, well, there's already a source of forcing uh, inside cells. And that's just this idea of cell noise, right? So already, and we see this in a lot of the data, things are very stochastic and time varying, and so can't we use that? So let me just say a little bit about noise in cells. Um, and so this was a very interesting experiment that Michael Ulowitz did uh, back now about 10 years ago, where he said, look, we know that, soil, so, uh, that cells are very noisy, and so if I have two genes, one that expresses a red fluorescent protein and one that expresses a green fluorescent protein, uh, and I put them on the chromosome of a cell, or I put them uh, on a plasmid, uh, then uh, if I look at the fluorescence, we don't expect the fluorescence to be dead constant, right? Because the cell's growing and splitting and dividing and right, various things are happening. We would certainly expect to see uh, the red and the green levels go up and down in some noisy way. 
But if they're on identical promoters and they're both integrated in similar spots on the plasmid or on the chromosome, we would expect them to go up and down in the same way. I have some noisiness from the cell environment. That noisiness causes fluctuations. But I've got two identical copies, essentially, of my circuit. Uh, and so they both ought to behave identically. And so uh, this idea uh, that they might do that sounds good. So we get a bunch of yellow things. So these should be at different intensities, but sort of all yellow, some mixture of red and green. Um, but if you actually go take data, that's not what you see. In fact, what you see is that red and green vary independently. And if you've done anything in sort of molecular dynamics or thinking about it, of course that's what happens. Because even though these are identical copies, right, the binding events of RNA polymerase binding to one or the other are independent events. And there's no reason why the same number of RNA polymerases should bind and transcribe and eventually translate uh, the protein for red fluorescent protein and green fluorescent protein. So they're really independent. So Michael. Uh, likes to separate these two. And so uh, he coined this notion of having extrinsic noise. So extrinsic noise is global to a single cell, but varies from one cell to another. So in other words, the cells might be different sizes, and they might have a different number of ribosomes or different number of RNA polymerases. But it's global to that entire cell. Everything in that cell is going to see the same effect. Versus intrinsic noise, which is the inherent stochasticity uh, inside of a cell. And so just the fact that reactions occur, and they occur in different orders and different times, and there's a propensity for a reaction to occur, but uh, you may not get, even with identical propensity functions, the events may actually be different. And so this was sort of an interesting thing to think about from the point of view of doing system identification, because we have this noisiness inside the cells, and so maybe we can use that as our sort of forcing function uh, somehow and do system identification. And so the question was, you know, can we do something like that? And so. Traditionally, what we would do, of course, as I already said, is that we would look at a model like this, and I'd say, okay, so here's a model for, this is the LAC operon. Remember, I described this as the PID loop of the biological world. So this is just a picture of all of the reactions that go on uh, in expressing the genes that metabolize lactose in E. coli. Um, and here's a simple three-dimensional model for this. Um, it has a bunch of uh, co coefficients that are in it that are unknown, corresponding to degradation and dilution rates and various uh, chemical reaction uh, constants and other things time delays, right, you know, various exponents corresponding to dimerization and other types of reactions. And I like to identify these, right? So I've got three differential equations. I've got one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, I don't know, maybe a dozen different parameters, right? So the question is, you know, how do I go and identify that? Um, now, one way is to do forced response. We don't know how to do that. Another is to do gene knockout. So I knock this gene out over here and I see what happens, right? And so one thing I have to say is you've got to be careful about gene knockouts because when you knock out a gene in a closed loop system, the system will react to that and it'll move you to a completely different operating point, right? So now all of a sudden, I'm trying to identify the dynamics in this region of my state space. I knock out a gene, I go over to that region on the other side of the room, right? And I identify the dynamics over there. But the system I'm interested in is over here, right? So they're different dynamics. So you do have to be careful about uh, how do you do that system identification. And gene knockouts may not give you quite what you want. Um, but again, we have this sort of notion of noise, and so maybe we can use that. So just as a simple example, imagine that I looked at a situation where I said, well, I've got two genes, A and B, and let's suppose they're not connected together, not regulating one another, versus a situation in which A is repressing B. Now, if I could control the concentration of A, I could plot as a function of the concentration of A what B should do. And if there's no uh, connection between them, then B should be expressed at some level independent of the expression level of A. But if one is repressing the other, then when A is low, B should be high. And as A goes high, B should be low. And so I should be on this curve. And I can use the fact that if I take data um, the data is going to be noisy, and so if I just go look at a given cell, it's not going to have exactly this amount of B, or if I look at 100 cells, I'm going to get some distribution in B, and I'm going to get some distribution in A, and if these are independent distributions from one another, then maybe I get some spread of points that looks like this, but of course if one is repressing another, then if A happens to be high, then B should be low in that particular cell since they're repressing, and so I should see that they line up on some curve. Right? So if I just go take noisy, steady state data, I should be able to separate out uh, what these properties are. The difficulty is that this is true if you had purely intrinsic noise, but when you have extrinsic noise, everything is coupled. And so in particular, if I have extrinsic noise, then if A goes up, B will go up because there were more ribosomes or more RNA polymerase or other things. And so the data is not going to lie like this. It's going to lie along some line, right? Because if one of them goes up, the other one goes up. And now the problem is that when I superimpose uh, this sort of correlation on top of this expression, I get something that looks like this. And we don't know what the difference of intrinsic and extrinsic noise are necessarily. So I don't know how much intrinsic versus how much extrinsic. So the question is, is it something with low extrinsic noise and I don't have any regulation? Or is it something with higher extrinsic noise and I do have regulation? I can't distinguish between these two from steady state measurements without knowing what the noise levels were. And that's itself a hard measurement to do.
So, of course, you know, if you think about this for a little while, you say, well, you know, you're not using all of the information you have. We've already seen this a couple of times, right? You should look at the dynamics of what's going on and see whether that gives you uh, some ad additional information. Dynamics can be very important. And so, in particular, if I look at the dynamics of the expression level for uh, A versus B, um, then in the case where A is repressing B, then if A goes up in time, so this is now the time axis, then a little while later B should go down in time, right? And the amount that it goes down should be the strength of the repression and the, the correlation time between these two signals, so how long does it take before it goes down, uh, should tell me something about the dynamics of this interconnection. And so, in particular, if I look at time responses, then maybe I can tease out the difference between these two. And so if you do a little bit of very simple analysis, then indeed you find that in the case where you have purely intrinsic noise, what you would see is for something where there's no regulation, you'll just see a flat line in the correlation function. Uh, for something in which it's repression, you'll see a dip negatively. The dip is negative because you have to shift one curve back in time, and then when you take the dot product between those two curves, you get a negative number, right? So when you do the correlation, uh, you'll see a negative number. And so I can certainly tell here uh, that I have either no regulation or repression, and you could do similar for activation. If I now look at the case where I have extrinsic noise only, then even in the case when you have extrinsic noise, which normally would have just produced something on this line, I can still tell, I still get this correlation here, but even in the case of extrinsic noise only, if I look at the dynamics, I can separate out the fact that, you know, everything goes up, but a little while later, B comes down a little bit because it's being repressed. And so I can somehow sort out what's going on. And if you have a mixture of extrinsic and intrinsic noise, uh, then you get some combination of these two figures. And so if I show you the time correlations between these two traces, I can get more information about what's going on in the cell uh, and maybe try and understand is something connected or not connected. And so from a kind of theoretical point of view, this is a fairly, you know, if I put models down, all of this stuff just sort of falls out. And the question was, does this actually work? If I go put this in cells, right, can I actually see something that's going on? And so what Mary did is that she built a little circuit to test this idea. And so here was her test circuit. Um, and so what she did was uh, that she uh, took a situation in which she had YFP uh, fused to uh, lambda C1, which is another protein. So now I've got YFP kind of hanging on the end of this protein. And lambda C1 was set up so that its promoter would repress, well, so the, there was a promoter in front of RFP that would be repressed by lambda C1. So if, if YFP is high, RFP should be low. And then there was another piece of the circuit that just had CFP, cyan fluorescent protein, and no regulation there, right? So this basically covers these two cases that I considered. Um, this is probably as good a spot as any to just say a little bit more about the kind of state of uh, synthetic biology. Um, this is a synthetic circuit. These things don't exist in nature as a natural circuit, so we build these circuits. Uh, the way that you do that um, is that uh, all of these correspond to DNA sequences, um, and these DNA sequences you can lay out uh, into a line. And so here all we've done is that we've sort of taken C1 and fused it to YFP. So this is the DNA sequence for lambda C1. This is the DNA sequence for YFP. There's a little bit of a linker DNA sequence in it. This will eventually convert to a protein. It will get translated, transcribed and translated into a protein that has the C1 protein bound to this fluorescent protein. There's a promoter sequence in front of it that we can define. Similarly, we can put in RFP, and here we've put the promoter in front of RFP that is repressed by lambda C1. So we can go grab that out of nature, um, and uh, there's all of these sequences are up on the web, uh, and then we've put CFP here. And so essentially we get this DNA sequence, um, and as I mentioned yesterday, the way that you now do this is that you go onto the web and you grab these DNA sequences for the different parts and you put, take an editor, often a text editor, Word works pretty well actually, um, and you just cut and paste the sequences of letters together, ACTGs, right? And then once you get it in the order that you want, uh, you sort of select all, right? And you know, copy it into your buffer and then you go to Blue Heron or DNA 2.0 or one of these synthesis sites, right? You log in to your account, right? There's a big box, right? It says, what sequence do you want? You cut and paste your sequence into the box, right? You press the buy now button, they charge your credit card, um, and then uh, four to six weeks later, when Mary did it, it cost $1.20 a base pair, and it took uh, eight to ten weeks. Um, so at that time, right, you press the button, uh, and then they send you back via FedEx a little vial um, that has your DNA in it, okay? So from the point of view of, there's a lot of biochemistry going on in creating that, and I don't care, okay? Uh, you know, I just need a credit card number, right, and a text editor, okay? And I can now design my own devices. So, Why do you need a at all? So we, the bacterium we use, of course, to, pr to do all of the transcription and the translation. We can also do it in a test tube. So in this particular case, we, as you'll see, we're interested in identifying natural circuits, so those occur in bacteria, right? So sure, you could do this in a test tube if all you wanted to do uh, was sort of see whether this circuit worked, but we care about understanding both natural and engineered circuits. So 
What they send you back is a plasmid. It's a ring of DNA with your, cir uh, your circuit inserted in it. It has an antibiotic resistance in it. Um, and what you do is that you trick the E. coli into absorbing this DNA uh, into the cell. And then you grow it in the presence of an antibiotic. Um, and only those cells that contain your plasmid uh, will be able to grow. Uh, and so this is the way you make sure that your circuit is in the cell. Because right? if you just put the circuit in the cell, uh, then there's some metabolic cost, and so eventually it will kick that plasmid out of the cell when it replicates, and those will grow slightly faster and your circuit goes away. So you trick the system by putting in this antibiotic resistance. Right? So this is, of course, the tools that molecular biologists have been using for decades now um, and are becoming increasingly common in engineering curricula to sort of understand how to build these things. So we did all of this. As I said, it took about eight to 10 weeks. Uh, cost at the time, uh, I think we, we synthesized something that was about 5,000 base pairs long, so it cost about $6,000. Um, now you get these things in three to four weeks for 30 cents a base pair, uh, so it's much cheaper to do circuits like this um, and getting quicker and quicker. All right, so she does all of this. We put it under a microscope. Uh, we measure uh, what the fluorescence levels are of, C of YFP, RFP, and CFP. Uh, and this is what sort of a typical movie looks like. You've seen several of these. I showed you some for the repressor later. Um, one thing that's nice is uh, that you immediately get thousands of traces. Right? Uh, so one data run gives you thousands of experiments simultaneously. You have to be a little bit careful because your experimental data are all correlated at the beginning. As you look at the end, you say, okay, this cell here, what was the intensity of fluorescence? And you go kind of back in time, right? At the very early time, there's only one cell, right? So if you look at two different cells, they're going to be 100% correlated at the beginning because they have the same parent cell. So, but nonetheless, you can do that uh, calculation, and you can calculate out the correlation functions. And if we do that correlation, for this particular circuit, uh, here's what we get. So we get exactly uh, kind of what we expect, uh, which is that in the case of the CFP uh, to YFP correlation, we see this peak that's very representative of uh, no connection between them. Uh, and in the case of RFP and YFP, uh, we see this very characteristic uh, negative hump in the negative time, which tells us the repression is going on. And so this test circuit sort of matches up with uh, the simple analysis that we did and says these things can be done. 100 minutes reasonable in terms of that time frame? Yeah, because the problem is that the, the, the dominant time scale for transcriptional regulation is determined by the dilution time of the proteins, which is the cell divide time. Uh, and so, you know, depending on what your media you're growing it on, could be anything from 20 minutes on the rich media to a couple of hours. So, yes, those are reasonable time frames. Um, and uh, if you, this movie again, very sped up, um, but the repressor as I mentioned yesterday, it has an oscillation period of about 45 minutes, same reason. Um, that's the dominant time scale. Okay, so um, great, so yeah, we thought this is cool, it actually works. And the question was, well, can we use this in a real circuit? I mean, in a circuit that already exists rather than the one that we constructed. And so the next thing that Mary did was to go and sort of say, okay, well, here's a circuit that exists in nature um, in which uh, it's part of the galactose uh, regulation pathway in E. coli. Um, and what happens is that GAL-S regulates GAL-E, it represses GAL-E but you can actually turn off that repression mechanism by putting FUCOSE in. And so the idea that we picked this circuit because it would allow us to, by addition of FUCOSE, to test both cases. And so if we don't put any FUCOSE in, then GAL-S should be negatively regulating GAL-E, and we should get this blue curve here without the inducer. But if we put FUCOSE in, it turns out it blocks that repression mechanism. So the diagram's a little misleading. It sort of should be down here. It blocks this repression mechanism, and so now GAL-S is not connected to GAL-E, and so fluctuations in GAL-S should not affect GAL-E. And so we built that circuit, um, and we did that using something called a promoter fusion. So we didn't actually change these proteins, but we went in and put duplicate copies of the promoter um, uh, for GAL-S and GAL-E and put fluorescent proteins behind them. So this is a pretty simple modification to make. And we just put in a plasmid, essentially, with those in it. Uh, and we went and we ran the data. Um, and so we did exactly the same thing that I showed you before uh, with this circuit, and here's what we got. So that doesn't look the same. Right? In fact, it doesn't look right at all. Basically, it says that they're not connected. Uh, to each other, right? Because in both cases, with and without the inducer, we just get this characteristic profile that looks like <coughs> two independent sources. So that was a little odd. This is the, you know, sort of known mechanism for this, yeah? What is the modification? We, uh, all we did was that we built a plasmid uh, that had in it a promoter for GAL-S, so the, the sort of sequence that goes in front of GAL-S that causes GAL-S to be regulated by, uh, to, to uh, be transcribed. Um, and then, sim so that's this uh, camp CRP coming in. And then similarly, the promoter sequence for GALI, right, in front of a flush protein. We put that on a plasmid, and then we put the plasmid in the cells. And so that's the only modification. We just insert a plasmid um, on appropriate antibiotic resistance with the right copy number for people who know these things. Okay, so that was odd. So, you know, it's not somehow doing what we expected to do. That was a surprise. We, we were looking at uh, 
we want to get the paper out quickly, right, Mary's starting to apply for jobs, or, you know, you just, you know, this is a good one, this will work, right, so we sort of do all of that. All right, so we then go back and look in the literature, and it turns out that if you look in the literature, you know, all the highly cited papers say this is the mechanism, and these are the dynamics, and this is why this is the right thing to do, but if you go look, you find a less cited paper that says, well, actually, you know, this might be the circuit, right? And what this circuit says is that there's actually another protein called GALR that can also repress the action of GALS. And GALR is such that uh, if FUCOS is not present, it will be expressed and it'll repress GALS. So if you think about the, the logic of this, the problem is that when FUCOS is present, it represses GALR but also GALS, so they're now uh, independent of each other. But if FUCOS is not present, then GALR will be expressed and that will repress this uh, repression, right? And so in neither case do you get any connection, right? So indeed, this model is consistent with these data. Um, and then we can test this by saying, well, okay, if that's the circuit, let's go knock out GALR. And so we can go and just knock out genetically, so we just cut it out of the chromosome, uh, GALR. And so if we do that, we're now back up to our original circuit, right? And so in principle, uh, this ought to work again. Uh, and then we go and retake the data. Uh, and indeed, right, in this case we see, right, it looks pretty much like this plot up here, right? Uh, and so indeed we see that. So this is interesting. Because one of the things it tells us is that this is a method of system identification that allows us to see whether or not something is active or not. In other words, what was happening was we happened to be operating in a context in which GALR was being expressed at a high enough level to shut this off. Other people who had been doing experiments had probably been operating in a slightly different context, different pH, different nutrient, different temperature, something or other, and their circuit looked like this because GALR was essentially right, not being expressed at that level. So the way that uh, Mary likes to describe this is that she says that this is useful for identifying active regulatory mechanisms, right? They're, they're connected still. This is still there. It's just a question of whether or not this pathway is still there. It's just a question of whether it's active. If I modulate something at the top, does it make it through to the bottom or not? Uh, and so this provides one way of doing that. So this is one technique for allowing us to use dynamics uh, and understanding of a little bit of uh, the dynamics of repression, transcription, translation uh, to try and tease out some of what's going on. Okay, so that's one thing that we were trying to do is to identify these various interconnections. Um, another thing that we've been interested in doing is understanding the role of feedback uh, in generating different types of behaviors. And so for that, I'll talk about a slightly different system. Um, and this is a system that's uh, still uh, the GAL pathway, but this time in yeast. So galactose is still uh, metabolizing galactose, but now in yeast. Uh, and this is the work uh, with Ophelia Venturelli. And we originally started looking at this because one of the things that you often want in various uh, biological circuits that you might design is the ability to switch behaviors, right? I want to go from something being off to something being on, and I'd like that switch maybe to be sharp, right? So that over a 2x change in some input, I go from being completely off to being completely on. And if you want it to go, you know, sort of a tenfold change or something like that over a twofold change in input, you need a high gain, right? So you need a sort of ultra sensitive response like this, right? And so what happens here is that at low concentration it's off, at high concentration it's on, uh, and in the middle there's this very steep uh, response that allows us to connect these two. And so we wanted to understand, you know, where this is uh, data from the GAL pathway. When galactose is present uh, at a low enough concentration, the galactose machinery is turned off, and then it quickly turns on and sort of stays on. In fact, there's a hysteresis that I'll talk about in a second. Um, and we wanted to understand, well, what's producing this kind of very sharp response? And this is what the circuit looks like uh, for regulating uh, the galactose machinery. Um, and one of the things that you see is um, that we have uh, GAL2 as a permease, brings galactose inside of the cell. Um, GAL3 uh, can bind to GAL80. GAL80 can bind to GAL4. GAL4 is an activator. And so if you start chasing through this, GAL4 is an activator for expression of GAL2, GAL3, GAL80. If GAL80 is present, it'll actually bind to GAL4 and sequester it. Um, and so it's repressing the activation. So GAL80 can be thought of like a repressor in some sense. But GAL3 can bind to GAL80 and sequester it. And so that is a repression of a repression of a repression. Okay? Uh, and so I've got these multiple nested feedback loops in here. Right? And somehow, in this set of dynamics, right, we're getting this ultra-sensitive response. And so one of the questions we want to ask is, okay, well, you know, is it this feedback loop coming up here, or this feedback loop, you know, can we say anything about what's responsible for this ultra-sensitive response in this particular system, right? So we assume that somebody's identified it, right? So, so we applied whatever techniques, this is what we think the active circuitry is, and now we want to understand, can we somehow under, uh, figure out why there are multiple feedback loops or what's going on uh, in terms of doing that. So Ophelia and her work uh, started to say, okay, well, uh, you know, I can start doing a lot of experimental applications, and we did many of those, um, but we also ought to be able to understand this with a model. Uh, and so the idea was to build a model that captured the experimental data. We used just ordinary differential equations of the sorts that you've seen multiple examples of already. 
Um, and we actually tried some very high dimensional models. We tried stochastic models and other things. In this case, uh, we seem to get the best results, both fitting to the data but also understanding things with kind of modest uh, or low order models, about 10 states or less. Right? So this is one where at least our experience was the right model to answer the questions we were trying to answer was not a highly complicated model but a relatively simple one. Um, relatively simple, I think, is probably in the eyes of the beholder. This is actually what the model looks like. Um, and so uh, this, for us, was a relatively simple model. Um, so it's got 13 states and 20 some odd parameters in it. Um, and, but you know, I mean, it's easy enough to simulate, right? No problem there. Um, the parameters come from the literature, so we didn't go measure all of these. We went out and looked. Some of them have to do with the cell division time, and some of them have to do with binding constants between various things. So these are things you can go find out in the literature. I think there were one or two that we actually had to measure, um, uh, like growth rate and things like that, but they were pretty easy. So, uh, here's a model. Somebody made this comment yesterday, you know, with a model this complicated, you could model an elephant, uh, right? Uh, this is true, right, in some sense. With this many parameters and this many equations, tell me what you want it to do, right? Uh, and I'll get it to do it. So what we told we wanted to do was to replicate what was going on in GAL. Um, and so uh, we did that. Uh, and so on the left are the experimental results. On the right are the simulation results. Again, we didn't fit very many parameters, mainly just growth rate things. The rest of them came out of the literature. Uh, and we were able to get, uh, so this is looking at different uh, promoters that we can put in front of the GAL pathway that give us different activation levels. So we were sort of doing experimental things to try and tease out the ultra sensitivity and how it changes as we replace different promoters in front of different uh, elements in here. So we're kind of replacing some of the promoters with other promoters. Um, and you sort of see the same trends, right? So the colors of the curves should correspond. They're all in about the right order, right? They're sort of, you know, coming up at a, you know, reasonably the right place, things like that. So I'll use that just to say that we trust that this model, if we analyze it and tell you something about this model, gives us some insight into the system. You should be very skeptical about that statement, um, but you have to work with the model yourself and sort of decide if that's right. Um, but it is at least a model we can now go and ask, well, in the model, can I tell you something about all of these feedback loops and what's going on? And so that's what uh, we tried to do. Um, and so in particular, one of the ways that we did that was to simply look at parameter sensitivity, right? And so in, if you sort of think about that model, one of the things you can do is you can say, well, let's suppose that I look at the relative sensitivity of the steepness, the slope of the uh, ultra sensitivity curve versus the various parameters. So this is a standard sensitivity plot. And what it's telling us is that if I make, if one of these is, uh, is one of these one, so that one, let's say, is something like one. Is that about right? Yeah, so this one says, if I modify this parameter, KR3, uh, by 10%, I'll see a 10% change in the slope uh, of that uh, curve, right? And, so, and if I see something that's very low, that says that if I make a 10% change in this parameter, it makes almost no difference whatsoever in what the slope of that curve is. And so now one way to think about this is that the, the things that are tall uh, are the things that are the mechanisms that play a strong role in the slope of that curve, right? Because if they didn't play any role, then changing them by 10% shouldn't make any difference, right? Uh, if they do play a role, changing them by 10% should make a difference. So this gives us a way to kind of go in and at least see what are the mechanisms that play some role in this. You could. The hard part is that, of course, to do that, you need to go change all of these 24 different parameters experimentally and run. <laughs> yeah, so we check some of them, right? So the th there's some things that are easy to change, some things that are hard to change, and when the, we pick the easy ones to change, and those we were able to correlate what went on. But uh, doing all of them would be a lot of experiments, and you know, as, uh, most PhD students will eventually say, hey, I want to get out, right? I'm sort of done with my experiments. Okay, so, but the other thing we can do with the model is we can, um, take out some of these feedback loops and see how these plots change. And so we used a slightly simpler model, so I apologize, it's not exactly the same model, uh, just uh, because uh, we, this correlated with some experiments and the, we needed to make it simpler for the experiments. Um, but for example, we can look at a situation where we have both feedbacks, so we got rid of one of the feedbacks and we're just looking at two of the feedbacks. If both feedbacks are in, this is what the, the absolute value of the sensitivity looks like, so we just plotted the absolute value. If we knock out one of the feedbacks and we look at just the positive feedback remaining, we, of course, still get some ultra sensitivity, but now the variability is much higher, right? That is, in addition to leading to the ultra sensitivity, it's giving robustness with respect to other parameters, right? So when we have both feedback loops in place, we get, you know, fairly good uh, robustness with respect to parameter variation. If we only have one of them, right, that robustness is not quite as good. If we have the other one, it's not quite as good as if we have no feedback, uh, it's not quite as good. Uh, those ones are population average curves. So, Good, so I'm going to get to that. Uh, so you're right. So 
Here, all we've said is that if we look at a population average and we look at the rate at which galactose on average is done, and at the time we were doing it, uh, our assumption, uh, and somebody pointed this out yesterday, it might have been you, was that all the cells had a graded response in some sense that, you know, uh, if you put in a little bit more galactose, they would all follow that curve, right? And then that should be something one should be skeptical about, right? But in this model, we were able to say that, well, to the extent that that model holds on at least a population average, at a population average level, here's the sensitivity of these things. There's a problem with the knowing of the, of the level of the mean. Yes. It, often. Good, so hang with me for just a second because we got exactly to the same place you're going, right? So I think, you know, when we first uh, developed these, uh, this is a nice set of results to sort of explain some of the possible mechanisms. But then we started probing a little bit further into what was going on. Um, and so just to sort of point this out uh, exactly in the way that you described, um, we started looking at uh, the systems and noticed that, in fact, what you expect to happen is that as I increase the galactose level, I follow that curve in a given cell. This is what actually happens. So these are wild type cells. This is galactose on the bottom. This is a reporter that's reporting the activity of that metabolic pathway. And what you see is that at low galactose levels, uh, the cells are off. So this is the mean is the black dot. The cells are off. Uh, and at high levels, the cells are on. Right? But in the middle, some of the cells are off and some of the cells are on. There aren't actually very many cells at intermediate levels uh, of um, metabolism. That is that they kind of sharply turn on, but what happens is some fraction of the cells turn on, some fraction of the cells turn off, and you just change the fraction of cells that are on and off. And as you just mentioned, there's really quite a lot of variability in these, right? So every one of these red points is some cell. This is just off of a flow cytometer. And so indeed, even at the lowest galactose levels we looked at, some of the cells are expressing the metabolic pathway at the same level as if they had been in galactose. Not very many of them, right? So there may be two, three, five dots out of 10,000 up there, right? But that's up there. And so we really were looking at an average of this curve somehow, right, as we sort of go up and down. And so we started diving in a little bit more uh, to look at this more carefully. And now, you know, same circuit sitting up here. And now you can ask the question, well, all right, so now it turns out it's bimodal. So what are we going to do about that, right? And we can ask the same question, well, why is it bimodal? Which of these feedback pathways is leading to things be, being bimodal? In fact, if you go look in the literature, the, the I, I would say, commonly accepted uh, explanation in this particular circuit is that the GAL3 feedback loop is responsible for bimodality. That is, if you knock out the GAL3 feedback loop, then the bimodality goes away. Um, and so uh, that is somehow the part that's playing that role. I should say you have to be very careful when you say knock out the GAL3 feedback loop. Right? So one way to knock out the GAL3 feedback loop is to knock out GAL3. That's knocking out GAL3, not knocking out the feedback loop. Why? Because if you knock out GAL3, there's no GAL3. You've got a closed loop system. It shifts to a different equilibrium point, right? So now you're looking at a different system. So in fact, the way that you have to knock out the GAL3 feedback loop is to take out GAL3 here and put in your own copy of GAL3 with an inducible promoter so that you tune the level of GAL3 expression to be what it would have been in the wild type cell, right? And what you've done is now knock out the feedback pathway. Why? Because before, if anything upstream sort of fluctuated, then you would see GAL3 fluctuate, right? But now if I put it on a separate promoter that doesn't respond to those, right, then those fluctuations do nothing to the level of GAL3. It's more or less constant. Of course, still very noisy. So, yeah, question? Were averages. So what... Yes, but the differential equations, of course, so there's several things. So one, uh, the differential equations themselves uh, are uh, a model based on an average of a large number of molecules or cells, right? So in some sense, the differential equation we wrote down was a model for the average. Okay, so anyway, so that was one an explanation, but because we were trying to sort out this issue about, you know, is it really ultra-sensitive or not ultra-sensitive? We went back and tried to replicate those experiments. Uh, and in fact, when we knocked out the GAL3 feedback loop, so that's this plot down here. So we tried knocking out GAL1, GAL3, various things. But if you look at the GAL3 feedback loop, you can see that our experimental results said, if I knock out GAL3, in fact, I still get bimodality. Right? And so it was another situation where this is the circuit that everybody was using, right? We tried knocking out GAL3. We couldn't get it to go away. We went and looked in the literature. Turns out uh, that there's another uh, protein that plays a role um, called GAL1. And GAL1, there's some evidence, also can uh, have an effect in a, some sort of a feedback way, right? So we went back to our models. We went back to um, the experiments. Um, and we started knocking out GAL1, GAL3, right, various other combinations. The only combination that got rid of the hysteresis, or of the bimodality, I'm sorry, was knocking out both GAL1 and GAL3. Right? 
Right? So in fact, these are somehow redundant. Right? If one is gone, you still get hysteresis. If the other is gone, you still get hysteresis. If you knock both of them out, right, then the hysteresis seems to go away. Now, I don't know why. I mean, why is it that the you know, organism evolved to have this particular pathway? Well, I mean, it's a good question. I'm not a biologist. I don't know. But what the theory tells us, in fact, so we can develop models for this. When we develop models for this, now with this extra gal 1 in there, we see by stability in our ordinary differential equation model, so two equilibrium points, and you get a hysteresis loop, and that hysteresis loop roughly, you know, so you can think of it as I sort of come down here, and then when I get to a high enough concentration of gal, I pop up, but if I lower the concentration of galactose, right, then I have some region here where I used to be low at that concentration of galactose, but now I'm high, right? So this hysteresis loop and the by stability that we would normally see sort of correspond to each other. And again, we can have models that have all of the mechanisms in them that we believe are sort of uh, represented in this picture, and they replicate uh, the results that we see. So I think these are interesting questions about uh, how to go and use uh, ideas from mainly dynamics, I would say, uh, a little bit of control, system identification, to try and understand these natural circuits. Um, one of the things, you know, after having done this for a little while, uh, I have to say I'm more impressed than ever with biologists because life is complicated. Um, and, you know, it's really hard to tease all of these things out. Uh, and, you know, you sort of think you've got the answer and then, you know, you go a little bit further and you find out you don't have the answer. And it started to make sense to me. Michael Dickinson, uh, who was a collaborator, used to say this to his students all the time. You know, you always say, don't scoop yourself. Right? And what he meant was, right, that you think you have a result, right, and if you keep looking, you'll find out you're wrong, right, and you will basically prove yourself wrong. So you should first get the result that you think is right out there in the literature, right? It's right up to what you sort of understand, and then you can go and write the paper that actually shows what you thought was going on was not the complete story, right? Um, so that's the way that he sort of described it. Um, so with Avelia, the previous results we've not published, right, because in part we scooped ourselves, right? We sort of figured out that, oh, actually that's not the real story, right? There's this sort of nice story, but it's not quite the whole story. Uh, and so now this is uh, work that's uh, actually just getting submitted this week uh, in terms of all the models and the other things. So, um, you know, I, th I think it's very interesting to think about these problems. It's very hard, I think, to, to deconvolve all of the complicated things going on. Twice now, we have thought we understood the circuit we were modeling and found out it was a different circuit, so that's a lesson for people who go do modeling, right? The two times that we've done it so far, it's been the wrong model, right? In other words, we couldn't get it to match uh, what we're seeing in experiments. Well, so I was mentioning this to somebody yesterday. I had this interesting conversation with David Baltimore over lunch. And I was telling him how you know, it was obviously important in biology that we use models more and control analysis and all this stuff. And he said, yeah, you know, I, I sort of agree, Richard, but what you have to remember is right, that essentially we don't actually understand the dynamics well enough yet. We're constantly discovering new things that we didn't understand before. So what are you going to model? Because right? you don't know what the actual system is. So it, it is part of the lesson. So. So I'll use that to say um, that we, uh, in part, have taken that as a lesson to look at an easier problem which is rather than analyzing uh, biomolecular feedback systems, how about designing biomolecular feedback systems, right? And so if we design biomolecular feedback systems, at least we have control, right, over what we're trying to do, right? And maybe we can get rid of some of the complexity somehow. So let me use that to sort of segue into talking about design of biomolecular feedback systems. Um, and, uh, you know, how might we build feedback systems that have some of these properties rather than try and understand what role feedback is playing. Okay, so. I mentioned yesterday uh, this area of synthetic biology, and I talked to you about the little three-ring, uh, the three-inverter oscillator called the repressilator, uh, and this uh, other example. And these are systems that have been designed. That is, somebody went in and put together uh, circuits that hadn't been done before. And the same synthetic biology uh, technology uh, that Mary Dunlop used uh, can be used here, so we can order these circuits now. Uh, and so it's you know just a matter of designing what the sequences are uh, and then ordering them. And the hard part's of course getting them to work. So what we've been looking at is not circuits, well, we have also been working at the uh, design of circuits that go inside cells, uh, but we've also been looking at a simpler class of circuits. And these build on some of the things that Shuki mentioned yesterday in these uh, different types of branch migration reactions. So I want you to look at this sort of diagram, so let me walk you through it. So this is a piece of DNA, a single-stranded piece of DNA that might be 100 oligos or 100 nucleotides long, right? So it's an oligo uh, that's about 100 NT long. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to order a second piece of DNA that is complementary to part of this strand. Right? And so this sequence down here is another piece of DNA, and it's got the right Watson-Crick base pairing. So if you put the two of these together in a test tube, uh, they'll actually bind together. And what you'll get is something that we call a template. Uh, and this template is partially double-stranded DNA. And the trick in this template, and this is something that Eric Winfrey came up with along with Jong Min Kim, uh, is that the promoter region for RNA polymerase, that's where RNA polymerase would bind and transcribe whatever's downstream, is arranged so that it's in this partially incomplete region here. Right? 
And RNA polymerase, even though the sequence is here for the, on the single strand that, that normally RNA polymerase would recognize, it won't bind to a partially single-stranded, double-stranded promoter region, right? It can't chemically recognize that that's where it's supposed to start transcribing. And so if I just put this template in with RNA polymerase, more or less nothing happens. Um, but I can do another thing, which is I can order yet another third piece of DNA. And this little short piece here we call an activator. And the idea is that it is the complement of this uh, overhang part up here, plus a region that's called a toehold region. All right, so it's a little bit longer than it needs to be, uh, maybe 10 base pairs longer, sometimes 20, um, sometimes 5. But uh, if I mix the template with the activator, what will happen is that the activator will bind to this partially incomplete segment, and I'll get double-stranded DNA with a nick in it. Right? And the nick, because the uh, sugar backbone's not sort of properly attached uh, where these two things go together. But it turns out it's good enough for RNA polymerase. That is, that RNA polymerase can recognize the promoter sequence now, and it can transcribe whatever is downstream of it. So what's downstream of it? Well, anything that I want, all right, I can put downstream. So in this particular example, one of the things that I put downstream, if you look, uh, is I've coded my activator sequence, the complement of that, and the complement of my toehold sequence. And so if I mix these two together and I put in RNA polymerase, uh, at first there will be nothing. Uh, and then as the RNA polymerase starts to transcribe, I will get RNA. And the RNA will have whatever sequence is on this upper strand. And part of the sequence on that upper strand is the toehold and activator complement. Now, it turns out that RNA and DNA are close enough that they'll bind to each other. And so if I get a high enough RNA concentration, it will actually go and start to strip off this activator. Right? That's negative feedback. Right? So this is the simplest negative feedback system. This is negative autoregulation, right? but now happening at RNA. Right? So there are lots of cool things about this. First off, it's dirt cheap, okay? and it's fast. So these are oligos. These are the same types of things you order for PCR uh, and other types of sequencing applications. right? And so they're cheap. right? So it might cost us a couple of bucks to order or mo enough of this to sort of run for months. Um, you can order it overnight. Uh, so if you order it by 10 AM, you get it by the next morning. So it's very fast. Um, so literally, we could design an experiment, go and order this stuff, put it all in a test tube. This is all done in a test tube. So essentially, you put in the right buffer conditions, the right NTPs and RNA polymerase, uh, and then you get things out. Um, and you can implement circuits. The other trick that uh, gets used, and again, this is the work of John Min Kim and Eric Winfrey, um, is to measure things. Uh, what you can do is that you can order your DNA labeled with a fluorophore, and you can order this piece of DNA, the activator, labeled with a quencher. And so if the activator is bound to the template, then the quencher is close enough to the fluorophore that you actually quench the fluorescence. And so we can tell what state the system is in right, by measuring fluorescence of these different fluorophores. You can put in different fluorophores in different colors and measure different things. So that's the way that we measure things. There are other tricks that we can use, aptamers and other things to measure RNA levels, but that's the basic one. All right, so you can put whatever you want downstream. So we call these genelet circuits, right? They're not genes. They're not coding for proteins, right? They're just coding for RNAs. And the computation is going to be done by these RNAs binding to each other, right? So very similar to the types of uh, gates that uh, Shuki showed you yesterday in terms of the mechanisms that are going on, all happening at uh, this sort of biochemical level with all of the noise properties and everything else you'd expect. So what types of circuits might you code up? Well, one that we coded up that we thought was an interesting little test circuit is this one over here. Um, so this is a circuit where you have two templates. And the idea is to say, well, let's suppose that I need my RNAs that are being produced to be produced at the same concentration. So the kind of motivation for this is if I'm in a metabolic pathway, I may need stoichiometric ratios of certain enzymes or certain metabolites or other things. And if I've got too much of one or too much of the other, I want to regulate them to get, bring them back into, uh, say, one-to-one -one stoichiometry. So here, we want to have the RNA produced by R1 be in one-to-one -one, uh, stoichiometry with the RNA produced by T2, even if I have uncertainty. So maybe I pipetted a little bit too much T1 in, or maybe the promoter sequence for T1 is a little bit stronger than the promoter sequence for T2, or there are other details. Can I design a feedback circuit that would try and regulate these back to the same level? So here's the feedback circuit. Um, and in fact, it's exactly this sequence. So if you think about T1 is producing uh, this uh, particular sequence with I equal to 1 and J equal to 2, and T2 with the swap of that, um, then what's going to happen is that the RNA produced by T1 is actually going to be the complement of the RNA produced by T2. Right? And so if they're in one-to-one -one stoichiometry, then R1 and R2 are going to find to each other and bind. But suppose I have too much R1. If I have too much R1, then there'll be an excess R1. But this excess R1 is actually going to downregulate its own production. Right? So if I have too much R1, I'll stop producing as much R1. If I have too much R2, I'll stop producing as much R2. Right? So this is a uh, negative feedback rate regulator. 
All right, it's actually regulating not the absolute concentration, but the rates of production, because you get some small error. So if we put integral feedback on it, right, we haven't, I haven't talked about how to do that yet, uh, we could do a little bit more. But it's just a simple circuit uh, to sort of do that. And so, uh, again, uh, Eliza Franco uh, did this work. If she were here, she would shoot me for saying this, but Eliza sort of designed this uh, and uh, ordered the things, and the next day went into the lab and took the data, and then out came the results, right? Uh, except somehow the first seven times we did that process, instead of taking two days, uh, it took two months per iteration, right? Um, but once we got it down, we can really do this stuff quite quickly. Um, the other thing about this is um, that the models for this are just uh, mass action, right? So, you know, sort of reaction rate equations. Um, and, and they really are, these are happening in test tubes at relatively large molecular counts, and so they really should match quite well. So we're surprised when our models don't match. Okay, so we actually built this circuit and went in and implemented it. So here's uh, data uh, from an experiment. So what you're looking at here uh, is the concentration of R1 and R2. Um, and so we uh, put in initially more T1 than T2, and so we get a large production of R1, much more than R2, and then we see it down-regulate. Right? And so we get now equal, roughly, amounts of R1 and R2. We then add in more T2 so that we have roughly equal concentrations of T1 and T2. We see both of them move up. Right? You see some error. Right? So just like most control systems, right, they're not going to be perfect regulation. Right? So you get some error. Um, we then put in more T1. Uh, and again, now at this point, the T1 concentration or the R1 concentration shoots up, recognizes right, via this feedback mechanism that is too high, and down regulates itself back to the right level. So if you plot that, you know, sort of do more experiments and sort of plot things, if we look at the initial ratio of templates versus the final ratio of RNA, if you had no regulation whatsoever, then if these two templates uh, were in different ratios, then you would see the ratios of RNA match that. So that's a one-to-one -one line, right? So if I put in twice as much T1 as T2, I should see twice as much R1 as R2. If I had perfect regulation, then the ratio of the final RNAs should be one, independent of what the initial templates were. Right? And these are what the data look like, right? And the T1, the two different colors are one more than the other. So T1 over T2 and T2 over T1. And so indeed, you see there's some level of regulation. This is what our model says we should get. So it may not be the right sign, but it's at least kind of the right magnitude, roughly speaking. Uh, and so we indeed see some sort of regulation. So these sort of genelet circuits are very interesting for exploring different types of biomolecular circuits that you can build. Um, I'll tell you a little bit later about things that you can do with them uh, and how they relate to cells, but just as a kind of test framework for trying out ideas, it's a very interesting technology. Um, another thing that we looked at uh, was uh, different types of circuits. So you can build oscillators, like the repressilator. Um, you can build an oscillator. So this is an oscillator built out of these genelet circuits. And one of the things that happens in oscillators in biochemical circuits, just like in oscillators in electrical circuits, is if you load down the oscillator too much, right, you change its frequently, frequency and amplitude. Right? You're drawing too much current out of an electronic amplifier or oscillator, you'll do that. Um, but similarly here, if you draw too much of the various uh, concentrations, and so if we look, for example, this is these oscillator circuits. These are uh, experimental results. Um, and if we uh, increase the amount of load, so we put something here that binds to one of the pieces in here, uh, then we see, in fact, that these oscillations get smaller and smaller and smaller as we increase the amount of load. Oh, sorry, this one's a simulation. I'll show you experiments in a second. Um, and so uh, we see that uh, these loading effects come in, uh, and we can then look at, well, can we design insulator circuits, right? So this is going to be another genelet circuit. Right? And the idea in this genelet circuit is that it's going to somehow have high and low impedance in the right direction so that it insulates the oscillator from the load. So as I increase the load, what should happen is uh, that I somehow uh, stay at the same amplitudes. So we implemented those circuits. This is what the circuit looks like for the insulator, right? So that's the strand diagram we call these uh, for the insulator. Uh, these are data uh, where we're increasing the load. These are real data now. Um, and don't have an insulator on there. And so you see, you know, sort of there's this black line, and then there's this one under, and then this blue one, and then this one here. And each time it's getting smaller and smaller, or getting damped out. If we put in our insulator circuit, then these are what the data look like. And so we see that the amplitude is not very changed as a function of the load. So we can really design circuits and start looking at these effects. Um, a little bit more interesting circuit that we're in the process of designing right now is an event detector circuit, still built out of these genelets. Uh, and so the idea here is that I have two species that I'd like to detect, A and B. Um, and I'd like to know, did A occur? Did neither occur? Did only A occur? Did only B occur? Did A occur followed by B, or B occurred followed by A? Right, so I'd like to know if both A and B are there, which one occurred first? And so this is a circuit that does that, using a couple of bistable switches and other types of tricks. And in this particular case, our output is actually fluorescent protein. So it turns out you can put these uh, transcriptional circuits uh, into uh, various uh, kits that people make that do both transcription and translation, not cells. If you put them in cells, they will go away. The cell will attack them um, because they look like foreign, they look like viruses and other things. But if you put them into these transcription and translation circuits, um, they work. 
Uh, and so the idea here is that if I had no input, I'll see all of the fluorescent proteins. If I had only A, I'll see GFP then RF and RFP. If I had only B, I'll see BFP and CFP. If I have A, then B, I see GFP. And if I have B, then A, I see CFP. So this is a little event detector. And this might be something that you use where you say, well, uh, when I see some chemical, then apply some output until that chemical, until another chemical pops up. Right? And so maybe I want to go and I'm doing some therapeutic someplace, right? and I want to say, well, I saw something as a signature, and then once I see some other signature event come in, right, then I want to turn off my actuation. Right? This would be the type of circuit that you might implement that way. So we've gotten all of the pieces of the circuit together uh, and tested, uh, and we're in the process of putting the entire circuit together, and all of the pieces have worked well um, and done what we expected, and our models kind of match. Okay, so um, as I said, these are very interesting circuits. Um, they, you cannot put them in cells. Right? Genelets don't work inside cells. Genes work in cells. Genelets don't work inside cells. Um, and so I won't go into this in a lot of detail, but just to say we are also thinking about how to put similar circuits in cells. Um, this is a circuit um, that is uh, a feedback circuit that we're in the process of building. Actually, the part you see down here um, is a sensor part of this. Um, so one thing we can imagine is saying, look, I'd like to build a circuit um, that has some uh, reference input, maybe some inducer, and produces some active protein that is either equal to the inducer concentration or in proportion to it, right? Same thing as I did in this other one. I need to now have some way to compare my inducer concentration to my active protein, and I might have multiple regulation mechanisms, a fast allosteric type of regulation using phosphorylation or some other allosteric, you know, changing the shape type mechanism, or a slower transcriptional mechanism and maybe some internal feedback loops and other things, right? So we'd like to be able to design these circuits, now not out of genelets, but out of genes, or at least things that we can put in cells. So for example, one of the things we've been looking at uh, is how to just do this sensor. And so this is the equivalent circuit to that one that I showed you, the Lisa Franco built, that was the negative feedback rate regulator. That is the one that was trying to keep R1 and R2 the same. Um, this one is trying to keep RFP and GFP at the same concentration. And this uses programmable protein domains. And so these protein domains are things that can, they're segments of proteins that can be used to bind to other segments of proteins uh, in, in known binding patterns. Uh, and we can actually design circuits uh, such that uh, RFP, if it's too high, will actually uh, effectively activate GFP, and GFP, if it's too high, will repress RFP. And so again, they kind of bring themselves back into equilibrium. Um, and so uh, we're in the process of implementing these. The initial data results look good. Uh, but just to sort of say, these are things that have a pathway, at least the ideas. We can test them first uh, in vitro in these kind of RNA circuits, and then maybe use similar ideas uh, to do things in protein. Okay, so. Um, just a couple last things to say about, you know, kind of this design-oriented side. Um, if you sort of ask, well, what would the class of systems that I want to think about if I'm a control designer look like, right? If I were to draw a block diagram and say, here's the control design problem in block diagram form for these biomolecular feedback systems, um, this is what I would draw for you. Now, if you were here yesterday, right, you may recognize this picture as the picture that I drew for you when I was talking about insect flight control, right? Um, but in fact, it's the same picture. Right? That is, we can think about having a whole bunch of dynamic elements and a bunch of nonlinearities, and these nonlinearities are the binding uh, curves and other things, hill functions and things like that. And then an interconnection matrix, that's what promoter do I put in front of what gene. Uh, and then time delays, because there are delays in these systems and it does take time for things to go on. Right? And so this is the exact same, and this is the same picture that we use in cooperative control and the same picture we lose in a lot of places. I think it's a pretty generic control picture for looking at uh, collections of distributed systems with nonlinearities, interconnection, and time delay as active or important elements in what's going on, and dynamics, right? So these are linear dynamics, but with n static nonlinearities that can couple them together. And so you can get reaction rate equations out of this. You can get all of the, you know, this form of a model will capture all of the typical, uh, every example I've written down so far that you've seen equations for, I can put into this form. Let's sort of put it that way, right? Okay, so there are a couple of interesting things about this from a synthetic biology point of view, right? So from a synthetic biology point of view, the control design part is down in the bottom. That is, the easiest two things for me to control are the interconnection structure, right? What talks to what, right? What activates or represses what? And time delays. So I haven't talked a lot about time delays, but time delays turn out to be something that's pretty easy to control, right? How do you do that? Well, if you have a transcriptional circuit, one of the things you can do is you can just put junk DNA, right? Really junk DNA now, uh, between your promoter and your gene. Right? If I do that, RNA polymerase has to walk down right, this DNA. Right? It takes about, uh, it's about 30 base pairs per second. Right? So if I put in uh, 300 uh, base pairs worth of DNA, right, I'll get 10 seconds worth of delay. Right? If I put in 3,000, I'll get 100 seconds worth of delay. Right? I can basically program that delay. Right? So this is very easy to design, and the interconnection structure is very easy to design. 
Hard to design, changing the nonlinearities, right? That's protein binding uh, kinetics and, well, I guess statics and other things, right? Binding energies and things like that. Those are hard. You're given a library of these, right? You're given a library of dynamics, transcriptional and translational dynamics, for example, right? Various uh, mass action properties, mass action rates. These are sort of, you've got a library of these, right, that you can connect together, and now you want to design how do I interconnect the elements of my library and how do I tune the dynamics with delays. So it's a kind of an interesting picture, I think, uh, for thinking about that. And so now we can start saying, well, what can we do on the theoretical end, right, just with this class of systems? So I'll just show you one result. Um, it's one that I think is quite, kind of cute and fairly easy to understand. Um, so, and that's using time delay specifically, right? And so here was the problem. This is work of Jabadalai and uh, Samaya Sajudi. And they said, suppose that I want to design a control system of this form, but what I have is I've designed a conventional control system. I took this as my process dynamics, uh, and I designed a controller, uh, let's say G of S, uh, that's the Laplace transform of the controller dynamics for this bottom loop. But now I need to implement that controller using some sort of time delays and, and interconnections, and I can make these be weights without too much problem. And so the approach that they took was they said, well, suppose you give me the G of S, that's the compensation that's going to go down here, the frequency response of the compensation loop. And now I want to approximate that. I'm going to approximate that by this g hat of s. And this g hat of s is going to basically be a linear combination of delayed outputs. And then I double integrate that. Right? So a double integrated linear combination of delayed outputs. Now why is this a particularly nice form of delayed feedback to put in? Well, because it turns out if you plot the impulse response of this particular linear system from y to u, the impulse response is a piecewise linear curve. Right? Because every time you get one of these delays, right, that would give you an impulse, but I'm integrating it twice, so that goes to a step and then a ramp, right, and by choosing the various rates of these things, right, I can get a piecewise linear curve out of it. And so roughly the problem is, given a G of S, right, plot its impulse response, that's this dashed curve here, and then choose delay points, right, and straight lines between those delay points that give you a good approximation to that curve, and that will be an approximation, time delay based approximation to a continuous controller design. So that's a way to implement a kind of arbitrary controller with delays. Right? Very simple idea. And you can go calculate out you know, what are the differences in frequency domain and other, you know, the various metrics you can calculate out. And there's some obvious things, right? You know, if I have a fast dip here in my impulse response and my shortest delay that I can probably get is you know, two seconds or something like that, well, I'm not going to get a very good approximation. right? So that also tells you some things about the class of controllers that you can implement, right? given a certain minimum delay that you can do. And these, of course, are things that we haven't yet applied to biomolecular systems. We've actually applied them in other domains, uh, these slow computing things, right? This also comes up there, right? If I can't compute very fast, I have to deal with delays. Maybe I can use the delays, right, rather than ignoring them. Okay, so that's a little bit of the types of theoretical things, I think, that fall out of this. Um, there are many other, I think, interesting aspects, but, you know, hopefully you'll carry away this diagram if you're a control theorist as something to look at. Okay, so last slide. So uh, where do I think we can get? Um, Here's where I think we can be in 18 years. So Shuki's seen this talk before. He knows that when I started, uh, I had 20 years up there. I'm actually keeping track of it. You can see that the first time I gave this was in June 2010, okay, at the International Workshop for Biodesign Automation, which is at DAC, which is the Design Automation Conference for Double E's. All right? So I gave this talk, and I said, in 20 years, here's what I'd like to be able to do. Um, and I'd like to be able to look at various application areas in material synthesis, environmental remediation, medical diagnosis, and delivery. But just to give you a sample problem, um, I'd like to design something like this. right? So I'd like to design a system that can find the arsenic, right? So think of this as biological remediation. I'd like a device that's no longer, no bigger than 10 microns cubed. Uh, it's fully autonomous, has all power sensing actuation carried in the vehicle. It should locate peaks in the concentration of arsenic in its environment and localize there, right? That's what E. coli does, except not with arsenic, right? With nutrients. But I want to do this completely synthetically and programmed, right? I want to program eventually, or have tools that program for me or give me the DNA sequences that do this, right? And so, you know, the question is, I got 18 years, right? So this is about the length of my career left, right? So, you know, that's sort of about what I've got, okay? So it's, you know, somebody asked me, why isn't it 50 years? Well, you know, 50 years are too long. I'm not going to get to see it, right? Not nearly as interesting, right? 18, I'll still be around. I can, you know, kind of help out, I hope. So how might we do this, right? Well, we know the type of circuitry that we might want to implement. But if I really want to build this, I would think about building it. I mean, you can do it lots of different ways. I would actually do it completely synthetically. So I showed you yesterday a little bit about DNA origami. Right? You can actually build 3D DNA origami to build something that looks like this chassis. And you can build more DNA origami that looks like these flagella. And people are starting to understand how to actuate origami by you know, sort of uh, binding and unbinding things. Right? And maybe we can actually get this origami to sort of flip back and forth a little bit. Right? 
Um, I think the types of uh, sort of computational elements that I showed you might be these gene circuits, right? If I've got a little piece of DNA origami that's enclosing something, I get to put the, the liquid that goes inside of it, right? I get to put whatever I want inside of it. I'll put my transcription kit, right? So I'm going to make these DNA origami. I'm going to put in them DNA, right, with these little transcription kits. It's got to run for maybe a half hour, maybe two days, right? You know, sort of depending on what it's going to do. And then after that, it just craps out, right? Then it's just a bunch of salts that are lying on the ground. Uh, you know, it's like skin flakes, right? You got DNA all over the place, right? That's not a problem, right? And so, you know, they just sort of sit there. So these are the sorts of things I think that uh, we might be able to do right, in 18 years' time. Um, I think that there are lots of uh, hard problems left to do. I hope some of the people here will get motivated and help us solve some of those problems, both at the theoretical level uh, as well as at the experimental level. So I'll stop there, and thank you very much for your time.